Most of this presentation is going to be delivered by um, Marie rather than myself because it's Marie who's project managed the piece of work that we're going to talk about. And no matter how many times she explains it to me, she's still the expert, and I certainly am not. But in terms of an, the overview, I wanted to just give you some of the background to um, why Skills for Care got involved in this piece of work. And also, I would guess that not everybody here probably knows what Skills for Care is. So I think it's an opportunity for me to just very briefly explain to you what Skills for Care is as well. Skills for Care um, is a not-for-profit um, organisation uh, based in England and Skills for Care has a responsibility um, to look at policy, strategy and training and education in relation to the whole of the adult social care workforce in England. Most of the funding that we have comes from the Department of Health but we have a, a role in working with employers across adult social care in terms of ensuring that their voice is heard within the Department of Health around workforce development. And also the other way as well, in terms of looking at the priorities of the Department of Health and ensuring that the Department of Health priorities around workforce development become part of um, the thinking of social care employers. I also think it's useful to, to, to point out um, that, that there's actually, the so adult social care workforce is nearly twice as large as the health sector workforce. There's over 1.7 million people work in adult social care in England across 37,000 individual businesses, which makes our job quite complicated. Um, now, the work that we're talking about here, we've done in partnership with Skills for Health, which is our equivalent organisation for the health service. They have one major organisation they work with, employing a million people, and a smaller number of independent sector health organisations. So, a positive and proactive workforce. We, we actually started this piece of work about three years ago um, from listening to our adult social care employers. And we began by developing something before this that we called um, workforce commissioning guidance around commissioning a workforce to support people whose behaviour may challenge. And we published that in partnership with the National Development Team for Inclusion um, about 18 months ago. And Marie led uh, a lot of the development of that work. And when, when we finished that work, we actually came to the conclusion that what we'd done was, was, was useful, but it was very, very generic. And it was very much about saying, how can we actually improve the way in which people... Um, are trained and educated or recruited and retained in relation to supporting people whose behaviour may change. But it didn't specifically look at the whole issue of, of restrictive interventions. So, so we went back to our employers and we said, do you think we need to think in more detail about this area or does the guidance that we've developed, does that take, you, take us far enough? And there was a very clear steer from adult social care employers to say, no, we want national guidance. So we went back to the Department of Health and said, um, we think we need to do this. And the Department of Health looked at us and they said, um, well, go away and give us a clear understanding of what you think it is we need to do. And then we'll tell you whether or not we think you need to do it. Um, that happens quite a bit with the Department of Health, doesn't it, Melvin? Yeah? Yeah? Um, but so, so at that point, that's when we engage with Skills for Health and also uh, with other colleagues to begin to think about how we might actually develop this specific piece of guidance. Now, uh, much of the work that we do, we very much start by saying, OK, how are we going to do this in partnership? So in order to develop this guidance, we involved practitioners, employers, commissioners, people with care and support needs, family carers and training providers. And we ran a whole series of consultations around the country to actually help us to develop this piece of work. Now, I actually wanted to add to this, di this, this diagram that was shown earlier because I think it's also important to say that whilst there is a, a lot of work that's been done around workforce development other areas in relation to, 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 to this work, we've done a, 
a great deal of other pieces of work which are relevant and have an impact, even though they are nothing to do with this particular area. So, for example, there is a, a lot of published work around culture change in relation to delivering different cultures within your workforce. We've done a lot of work on how to redesign your workforce successfully. And we've also done um, a lot of work in relation to the implementation of the CARE Act and how to understand the capacity of your workforce to change. Because it's very, very important, I believe, to understand that it's very easy to run a service or commission a service differently. It is very difficult to commission your workforce to behave differently and to work differently. And I would argue that both health and social commission, care commissioners are utterly useless at knowing how to commission a workforce to behave differently. How many of you have a job description um, and have changed jobs and had a different title put in your job description, but what you actually do hasn't changed? I can see a fair number of people either putting their hands Sorry, up or nodding. No, I didn't ask you to do that. Up, but... but the reason I say that is that if you are not supported to change the way in which you work, what is the point in changing your job description or changing your job title? You will not behave differently. Over to you. OK, thank you. As scared as I am of Melvin, I'm also acutely aware that I'm all that's standing between us and the toilets and the coffee, so I'll race if I can. So I'm going to talk about the guide um, primarily. I've brought a copy along to wave at you. There's lots of copies at the coffee area. Um, you can download it free off the web. It's free to have a hard copy. If you can't find one, let me know. We want people to take it, use it. Tell us if you think it's pants. Tell us what you think is brilliant. That's what it's there for. The last thing we want is for it to be ignored. Obviously, nobody produces something they want to be ignored, do they? Um, little diagram that's in here on page 8. It'll be on our website as a clickable version. Lots of what Dave and Ian have said has made things so easy for me because lots of this is common across both pieces of guidance that we worked on. So, as Ian said, all of health and social care. So, ambulances picking up people who are under the influence of some substance. People coming round from an anaesthetic on an orthopaedic ward, as well as health and social care services for people with mental health problems and learning disabilities, as well as the three people who come to my house to help me look after my dad. So all of those people are the health and social care workforce who may need to carry out some sort of restricted practice. So this diagram was a way of helping people see these documents cover everybody. But there are specific things that will help people who are particularly interested in a particular group of people or a particular situation. And hopefully this will work fantastically on the website. You'll be able to go and click and get taken to the resources that you're particularly interested in. There's another version which is about work that's currently ongoing to produce something that doesn't yet exist. Um, so, it's about more than just restraint. All of us agreed that and uh, this was our way of trying to conceptualise this and get this across to people. Um, people who know about positive behaviour support hopefully might recognise that little pyramid to the side which is you know that yeah some nods there everybody sort of recognised that I had to put it sideways to make it fit in long story. Um, the idea being, you know, with positive behaviour support, that most of your work is about understanding the function of somebody's behaviour, understanding their quality of life, improving things proactively, and then having a small amount of time that's about reactive strategies and a small amount of that that might be about a physical intervention or another restrictive intervention. Um, Thinking about it in the round, thinking about all of those services and coming round to the other side where you've got instances where somebody's wheeled through the door of a unit or arrives and you don't know anything about them. And then shades between that, you know, so if somebody does come up to your ward 
and they've had an operation, they're under an anaesthetic, you can know some stuff about them that might help you proactively work to help them keep their drips in and their oxygen in. That won't involve strapping their arms to the side of the bed. Um, perhaps more planned coming round. But lots and lots of interest from to services for people with dementia, really interested in how they could look at positive behaviour support. Um, so that was quite encouraging. One difference between the two guidances that Dave and I are talking about, we did work quite collaboratively on them, is that the, the DH guidance that Ian and Dave produced for DH looks at restrictive interventions, so things that are deliberately carried out to take immediate control of a dangerous situation. And our guidance covers that, but it also covers restrictive practices. So those things that the situation might not be dangerous immediately, um, but that it is going to be necessary to carry out some form of restrictive practice. So I think Dave was, uh, Ian was alluding to it. <laughs> Particularly services for people with dementia, where employers and workers and family carers told us how easy it is to slide from helping somebody to have a bath into encouraging, into coercing, into actually now I'm physically imposing this bathing on this person. But at what point do people recognise that they're doing something restrictive rather than something that the person might have enjoyed? Um, some other examples of restrictive practices that might be used in quite a positive way. So a young man who has very severe epilepsy to the extent that his consciousness is probably interrupted many times in every hour of every day, um, was eating jars of jam because he really liked the taste of jam and he couldn't remember what he'd eaten. Didn't want to put weight on, didn't want to get ill, had a family history of diabetes. So his support plan is that he, um, his personal assistants keep lots of food stuffs, stuffs locked away and he has a measured portion of jam that he can use each day and when that's gone for the day, it's gone for the day. Is that a kind of thing that you might recognise that you might be doing or training people in? Some people there? Okay, good. So it's about thinking about those restrictions as well. Um, and the reason why I think it made sense for our guide to have that wider remit, I knew I would need some water, to talk fast, um, is because when, when we thought about the skills, the knowledge, the confidence, the attitudes, the values that people need to work through making those decisions properly, it's the same. It's the same if you're talking about somebody being secluded or having some medication or whether you're talking about stopping somebody walking into the road in front of the traffic or whether you need to hold somebody's leg still in order to clean ulcers because they don't have the capacity anymore to understand that decision and it hurts. So we came up with some key questions that people need to be able to ask, answer and work out the answers to and they're those things around is there a real risk of harm and is it to the person or to someone else? Do they have the capacity? Because if the harm, risk of harm's to them and they've got the capacity to make that decision, I was struck reading the Winterbourne View report how many times incidences were apparently triggered by self-injurious behaviour. And you look and you think, well, the behaviour, you know, might be somebody slapping themselves or, you know, punching their hand or something. Well, is a proportionate response to that that somebody's held face down on the floor, you know? <laughs> Maybe somebody should just be allowed to hurt themselves, to take a risk. And one of the things that is good about the, the guides having the shared key principles is that one that we've talked about, about balancing safety from harm with personal freedom and choice. So those questions are in there. If you get the guide, they're on pages 15 and 16 as a... Um, some sort of flowchart, not intended to be an absolute answer, um, but to help people think through in what order do we need to ask these questions and who might help us to answer them. Jim and I are doing a workshop this afternoon. We're going to look at that a bit more. Okay. So, the idea of the guide is, as Jim said, to help employers decide on the workforce development 
For us, the workforce isn't just people who are paid, it's everybody who's involved in that. So it's the person themselves, their family members, other peer advocates, students, volunteers, people from other agencies who have an input into a service. People have to learn and develop together or equitably, or we get nowhere. We have families stuck in the middle of a GP saying, oh, I'll let him have some whiskey, it won't do any harm, and a consultant geriatrician saying, you must stop him from drinking whiskey. And they're left like, well, what? How? Who? If I don't even know what I'm meant to be doing, how am I ever meant to know how to get there? Um, and development. So our guide is not just about training. It should help people work through the whole process of what do we want people to do? Where do we find them? How do we help them get it right? What do we do if they're getting it wrong? It should guide people to work through these questions and help work out some answers. It doesn't provide all of the answers, but there are some things in it that we're very clear about that are a bit new. So it does say that anybody who's providing training about restrictive interventions should have or be working towards a training qualification. It does say that anybody who may be involved in carrying out a restrictive practice should have had training in the Mental Capacity Act. So there are a few definite new things that we put in there. We want people to be able to think about these wider restrictions, not just because it's nice or it's happening or what have you, but because our work with people who use services and works in services and train in people for services, let us to get a, a better picture of what we've been. Another thing that these guides share is a very everyday definition of restrictive practices, which is stopping someone doing something they want to do or making them do something they don't want to do. And I would argue, you may disagree, but we did say we wanted to be controversial and annoy people. If you have to use health and social care services, you will be subject to restrictions and restrictive practices. I think it's inherent. Let's think about it for a minute. Anybody staying here overnight, tonight? Do you expect to be able to lock your bedroom door? If you, if you do you expect to be able to, you may not wish to. If you get old and have to move into an older people's care home, are you sure you'll be able to lock your bedroom door then? Or do you just think you won't care then? Do you think the things that you do in private in your bedroom you might not want to continue doing when you're 70 or 80? I would be uneasy sleeping somewhere where I couldn't lock my bedroom door. Now, there may well be very good reason, reasons why an individual is not safe enough to lock their bedroom door. Do our services make that differentiation between individual people? Because I know when I went round looking for a care home for my dad, there wasn't a single place that didn't have a numerical keypad on the door. And I don't think every single person who was there had had an assessment that said they shouldn't be able to walk out the door. Other pictures up there, the stuff that happens de facto, by accident, somebody's walking frame gets moved so you can mop the floor and it doesn't get moved back. Oh, I accidentally put the call button out of reach. How familiar is that? Can people have their pets? How important are pets to people? Anybody here got a pet? Yeah. You think you're going to suddenly not want it if you had a carer coming into your home who said, oh, actually, I'm not comfortable around animals? Mobile phones, a lot of discussion about that, and I bet Dave and Ian had that too. I can completely understand if you're in charge of a mental health service, the fear that it, people can video stuff and have it on YouTube in five minutes, but also anybody here happily hand their phone over to me for the day now? Yeah? Okay, yeah? You'll happily let me look through everything that's on your phone and not be able to look at your photos and not be able to be in touch with your family? What if I wanted it for a week? What if you just experienced a personal crisis and you weren't well? You, you would feel fine about not being able to get in touch with your family and loved ones. Some of the difficulties there have been alluded to and the one that I want to particularly just mention, um, the issue that positive behaviour support Apparently, we've been told by some people who work in some mental health services, there isn't an evidence base for PBS in people with mental health problems. And they explained to us why that wasn't appropriate. So that was quite interesting. 
As Dave pointed out to me when we discussed it, well, as I knew already, that when you try something new, there isn't an evidence base for it. So at one point, there wasn't an evidence base in learning disability services. And it initially came from schools in the US. So it's a thing that can move and can evolve. Um, the people who said to us, we won't use PBS in our mental health services because there's no evidence base, we asked them, great, tell us what you do use that has an evidence base, and they didn't answer. So I don't know what that means. What it set up for me was this idea that, oh, so everything we do in health and social care is evidence-based. That's interesting, because it's not what I see. Um, anybody familiar with these five steps to mental well-being on the NHS Choices <laughs> website? Connecting with families, being active, making a contribution, doing something meaningful, learning, taking notice. So all our services pay attention to this evidence, do they? All our services put as much emphasis on these things as they do on people's medications or what's on the menus for the week or whether the risk assessments are up to date or the fire extinguishers have been checked. Not that I'm saying those things aren't important, but we have evidence about what makes and keeps people well. Do we listen to it? We know, for example, that time spent outdoors in the fresh air is a really key factor in people being and staying well. How many health and social care services make sure that people can go outside and get a breath of fresh air when they need one? Just how many of us were sitting outside there this morning and just enjoying that lovely courtyard? At the time I was looking for a care home for Dad, we visited about seven. We didn't find one where he would be able to just walk outside and be outside for a few minutes. And I wonder, mental health services as well, how many places can people just go out? When we asked, staff said, oh, yeah, they just need to ask and we'll take them outside. OK, so this man with dementia needs to conceptualise that he wants to go outside, find the words, find a member of staff who doesn't look busy because he won't ask someone who looks busy, for them to actually not be busy. Then they need to physically get outside, which in some cases meant a lift. Then... Is he going to be left on his own with no supervision, nobody making sure he's safe? Or is somebody going to sit next to him looking at their clock and thinking about all the things they should be doing? At that time, Jim was leading a project about social care and how it interacts with the arts. And I met some people who were doing stuff about people with dementia putting together a playlist of songs that were meaningful. I don't know if you've seen any of this stuff. There's stuff on YouTube where you can connect with people. And I asked Dad what songs would you like me to put together for you? We've got a little MP3 player. And I had a list of about 10 or 15 that I thought he would mention. And the one he said, I'd never heard him sing or mention in his life. Oh, <laughs> there we are. Like Ian, I also won't sing it. Do people know this song? No? Some people do. Google it. It's lovely. Um, Roy Rogers sang it and the Andrews sisters. We play it in the, in the car regularly now. It's called Don't Fence Me In. And when he said Don't Fence Me In, straight on YouTube, got the lyrics up, talk about a shiver running down my spine. Just turn me loose. Let me sit by myself in the evening breeze and listen to the trees. Um, had a bit of a laugh at uh, let me gaze at the moon till I lose my senses and certainly family, certain family members said, Grandad, it's too late for that. <laughs> I felt this was telling us something really important and because we couldn't find a service where he was going to be able to do that. So Dad lives with us now and um, that brings a whole raft of interesting debates around safety and personal choice and family life and Jim and I will be exploring some of those in the workshop this afternoon so if you want to know more about that come along and join in I've got a couple of minutes so I'll just whiz back to this um, the thing about evidence and evidence base fascinates me go and google micromort anybody know what a micromort is? Yeah, some people do. Super. If you're involved in doing risk assessments, I would love to know what data and stats you base them on. Because oftentimes when I've had to do them, it's been that. Um, evidence base. The fact that we do stuff on evidence base. Clown target. Anybody ever heard of clown target? Oh, super. 
Dad came back from the... Oh, it, why is it not playing nicely now? We're not going to get the pictures, never mind. Um, Dad came back from his uh, first day at a day centre that he goes to for people with dementia, and it said in his little book that he'd enjoyed doing Clown Target. We couldn't read the writing, first of all, but we deciphered it at the end. Clown Target is um, people with dementia throwing beanbags at a picture of a clown's face that has different points. For some reason, randomly, as far as I can see, depending on where you hit the target, this is a man who joined the Air Force in the middle of World War II and then spent his life putting out fires and running into burning buildings. If there's evidence that it's useful for him to throw beanbags, I really think they could think of a target that would be a bit more meaningful, a bit more dignified. Now, obviously, none of you have heard of Clown Target, so you don't do it, and I don't know the services that you're connected with. But just, you know... If we're not basing everything on evidence, let's have a think about why we are doing things. I'm not for a minute suggesting we ignore evidence where it exists, but I think not having an evidence base for something that sounds like it might work is not a good reason not to try it. Completely lost my place, of course. I always do. And I've taken out some lovely slides here that will just be seen in the workshop. Are people familiar with this quote from Lord Justice Mumby? Anybody seen it, heard it? Just to come back to that thing about balancing what we're doing, whether something is proportionate, whether the, a restriction that we're carrying out is necessary, proportionate, the least restrictive option. Coming back to this judgment that was made by the High Court Judge Lord Justice Mumby in a case where a woman wanted to stay in her own home and there was debate about whether she had the capacity and was she safe, did she have to move to a care home. What is the point in making people safer if we merely make them miserable? That's what he said. If that's where safeguarding takes us, then is that not just another form of abuse? And worse still, abuse that's being perpetrated by the state. That was the quote that he made, and that's something that I think we... I find that helpful to bear it in mind when I'm making decisions, primarily now, because I don't work in social care, primarily it's for family members and other people that I'm in touch with. If you look at something and say, is it safe? The answer's always going to be no, because nothing's safe. But if you look at it and say, is it safe enough? Is, is the consequences of what we do to stop it or make somebody do something actually worse than, than what we're doing? So the workshop this afternoon, we're looking particularly at issues of how this affects family carers, people who use services, and how those people can be involved in a productive way. Just wanted to lead you with this quote. We've got lots of quotes for other people. This was a lady whose um, brother had dementia and was in a care home. And she was presented with two options of how um, the system could respond to his challenging behaviour. He could be moved to another care home, which she was told would make him worse and hasten his death. Or he could have antipsychotropic medication, which she was told would make him worse and hasten his death. What a fantastic choice we're placing on people, isn't it? All about choice. How lovely. So, time for me to shut up, I think. <laughs>